My name's Daniel Brayshaw. I'm an author and teacher trainer experienced in writing for and working with secondary school students and teachers. I'd like to welcome you once again to Hand in Hand with Teachers, uh, Real Challenges, Real Solutions. In today's talk, let's consider mixed abilities. First, a simple definition. Mixed ability or heterogeneous classes are made up of students of different levels of proficiency. Okay. But as Penny Err suggested in the early 90s, these terms are misleading as no two learners are really alike and homogeneous classes don't actually exist. In fact, all classes are made up of learners who differ in many ways. Some of the most obvious differences include maturity and language ability. Let's start with maturity. Consider the developmental gap between the average 14-year-old girl and a boy of the same age. Girls reach what is called the inflection point, a halfway stage in brain development at around the age of 11, while dawdling boys don't get there until the age of 15. The problem is that sometimes immaturity is mistaken for a lack of ability, but we must be careful to avoid this misconception. Here's what I do to minimize potential problems caused by mixed levels of maturity. Towards the beginning of a course, I have a discussion with my students, centred on what I expect of them and, crucially, what they feel is appropriate behaviour in the classroom. We negotiate and agree classroom rules together and even draw up a contract for everyone to sign. Another challenge I often encounter in class is that students differ in terms of language ability. Actually, the term is not as straightforward as it sounds. In fact, we should consider two factors here. Proficiency, or in other words, how much language a student is able to understand and use at any given point, and aptitude, that is to say, language learning ability. For example, although a student may have a low level of proficiency and be weak in English, they may have a strong aptitude for learning and with the correct support, be perfectly capable of catching up. The trouble is, students vary in their learning styles and strategies and what works for one student may not work for another. So what can we do? Well, here's what I do to try to make lessons effective for students of varying proficiencies and aptitudes. I always aim to be flexible in terms of methodology and appeal to a variety of learning styles and abilities. This can be achieved firstly through the use of a good and varied course book and secondly a wide variety of supplementary classroom activities. When I say varied, I mean varied in terms of difficulty, length, skills focus, pace, interaction patterns, etc. To paraphrase a famous quote, you can't please all of the students all of the time but you can target as many of them as possible by varying your approach in the classroom. When it comes to helping students develop aptitude, it's well worth remembering that they not only pick up ideas from me, the teacher, but also from each other. To build awareness of different strategies for learning, I find it helpful to get the students to share their favourites by preparing a poster together or even a video guide. Subtopics can include things like how I memorise vocabulary or how I revise for tests, for example. Let's turn our attention to another challenge, namely classroom management with mixed ability groups. Before we go any further, it's important to define the term lockstep teaching. This describes a situation in which all students in a class are engaged in the same activity at the same time, all progressing through tasks at the same rate. This is very common where classes are large, furniture fixed and materials limited. When teaching a mixed ability group in lockstep, it's almost inevitable that some of the presentations and practice exercises will be too simple for the more able students or too difficult for the less able ones. Here's what I do to make lockstep teaching as effective as possible with mixed ability groups. As I mentioned earlier, I ensure there are a wide variety of activity types and levels of challenge. I also make sure I always have extra activities ready for early finishers. A good course will come with plenty of these. Here, for example, are some activities from the timeout section found at the back of new challenges. These are ideal for students who finish before their peers and would otherwise sit twiddling their thumbs and losing focus. Perhaps the most important consideration when teaching to varying levels of proficiency in lockstep is how the students are grouped. 
research shows that extremely effective learning takes place when one student is asked to teach another. This is because in order to teach, known information must be reorganized in the brain. Thus, pairing more and less able students can actually benefit both parties. Another approach with mixed ability groups is to differentiate input and practice according to ability. In practical terms, this requires good classroom management and the help of a course with plenty of extra components, ideally online ones. Here's how I structure a lesson where input and practice are differentiated according to students' abilities. Let's take the example of a grammar lesson at level 3 of the GSE or around A2 plus on the CEFR. It's a lesson on first conditional with if or unless and will future with when or as soon as. It's probably not the first time that students will have come across first conditional and certainly not the first time they will have met will future. Step 1. I begin the lesson in lockstep with everyone completing a warm-up activity together. Depending on the lesson length, I might use exercises 1 and 2 seen here on the slide. A listening comprehension containing examples of the target language. Or I might use something briefer if time is short. Step 2. Now I'm going to split the group. Less able students will stay with me for a presentation on the target language and more able students are going to use my lab or similar online materials and do a receptive activity. For example, a reading that I've pre-selected and which contains the target language. Step 3. We're going to come back to lockstep and complete a controlled practice activity together as a group. We'll use this one, exercise 4 from the book. I'll be monitoring very closely at this point to see how the more able students get on. If there are any problems, I'll ask the less able students who've just taken part in the presentation stage to try and help. This has the twofold advantage of allowing me to check how much of the presentation the less able students have understood and also to change the usual dynamic, which is good for the confidence of the less able students. Step 4. At this stage, we're going to split again. More able students will go back to my lab for more autonomous, controlled practice at their level, while less able students will complete further controlled practice with my support using extra materials found at the back of LiveBeat's student's book. After this, we have the option to swap roles if time. Step 5. Finally, it's time to come back to lockstep for the last part of the lesson and complete a freer practice activity together. For this, we're going to use exercise 7, the speaking and writing consolidation exercise from the lesson we've been working through. If things have gone well, I'll put students in pairs consisting of a more able student and a less able student. After the differentiated input in this lesson, less able students should be able to tackle the final activity with confidence, while more able students will have consolidated their knowledge and will benefit from working with a more proficient partner during this final stage. Before we sum up, a quick note on the use of online materials. It is, of course, possible to complete the lesson I've just described using printed materials. However, online materials have the advantage of being specifically designed for autonomous learning and requiring much less preparation from teachers. Remember, students differ in many ways and the diversity in our classrooms brings challenges but also opportunities for us and our students. With a bit of planning and very little extra preparation, it is possible to differentiate input and practice in mixed ability classes to ensure that everyone has a satisfying and successful learning experience. Thanks for listening.